Insight and Awareness Spiritual Explorer. Soul Intuitive, Emotional and Spiritual Mentor and Award-Winning Author, Lorraine Nylon. Welcome, Explorers. I'm your host, Lorraine Nylon, and today I'm very excited. We've got Kevin McKee, and he's the creator of the Royal We YouTube community, and he specialises in abuse therapy, life coaching, and personal development. And we've got a big subject to talk about, don't we, Kevin? Yes, Lorraine. Thank you. I'm honoured to be a part of your podcast. I appreciate you stumbling upon my work and thinking enough of it to include it with what you do. I'm honored. Yeah, well, it was actually a request from a listener that said, have a look at Kevin and this subject. And I thought, you don't see many people talking about why do narcissistic men refuse sex and affection to their wives? And I know that that narcissistic wives do the same to their, their husbands, but we're basing it on the clientele that we've had. These are the stories mm-hmm. and experiences that we know about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're, you've got four main points on this, don't you, Kevin? Yeah. Well, first of all, it's an interesting place to be because I experienced narcissistic abuse myself from women. Well, if I'm honest with it, and I think if we're all honest about this form of abuse or bullying, however you want to talk about it, we, we experience it all of our lives. You know, we see it from childhood on up, uh, aunts, uncles, some teachers, your, your schoolyard bullies. But not until more recently do we have a, a name or something to put to it. And I think that's what helps people distance themselves from narcissistic abuse and be able to stand back and say, whoa, there's something different between me and that person. So that's really what it is. But the reason I bring this up is because my clientele base or my fan base, whatever you want to call it, is predominantly women. And so I didn't start it with that in mind. That's not what I intended. But suddenly, uh, women are are calling nonstop. And so I'm I'm listening to the stories of women coming out of difficult relationships, trouble in their marriage, which was difficult on me because I come from a non-denominational Christian background. And I used to believe that marriage is something that is a staple. It's a foundational part of of life. And I was all for marriage, but then I'm listening to these things. And one of the things that always stood out to me was the lack of sex and affection. And it bothered me because the women I, I have helped are extremely beautiful and Mm -hmm. extremely articulate. And as a man myself, the thought of listening to these women tell me that their husbands were not affectionate with them, it blew my mind. And and I had to, and as I dug deeper with these people, wait a minute, you're, you mean to tell me that you as a woman are trying to be affectionate? Oh, yes, yes, I've tried. I've bought in lingerie. I've done this. And it, it blew my mind even more. I was like, wait, wait a minute. You're telling me that you're, not only are you willing, but you're doing all the, and you're being rejected. And so, it got to me, it upset me, and it was a very common theme. And so over the years of coaching women, I started to gather just the typical reasons. And as you stated, there were four typical reasons that I came across. And number one, the number one reason was pretty mind blowing. But some of them that I'll touch on real quick, and then we'll go from there is was number four, uh, I believe was cheating. If a male was outside cheating. But however, the reason this wasn't a primary one is because typically men who are out cheating will get it anywhere they can. So it wasn't uncommon for them to cheat and then come home and also have affection with their wives. So that's why that's kind of the last one. But I did hear that from time to time that I know my husband's out doing other things, but he won't be with me. And and the reality is, is that if your husband is or, or partner is refusing to have um, any affection or sex with you, it is normally what females first think is, okay, he's getting it somewhere else, or they flip it back on themselves and go, oh, this just proves that I'm unworthy, I'm unattractive, you know, he's lost his desire for me. So they, they turn it back on themselves and all of a sudden they think they're the problem. And there's a lot of shame that comes in that because instead of, 
instead of looking at there's an issue with the person you're with, when you take that issue and put it on yourself, that shame keeps building. So the more Mm -hmm. times you're rejected and Mm -hmm. a lot of the women, as you would know, have stories where the rejection isn't just, you know, some of it is absolutely cruel of Mm -hmm. where a narcissistic person will go. You know, they will mm-hmm. attack every body part they've got, every... I had one lady said her husband had actually attacked and put down every move that she had from the way she kissed to the way she hugged to every part of her affection that she could show to the point that she had nothing left. Right. And I thought, oh, and, she, and it was the shame that kept her very quiet about it. She was embarrassed right? It's heartbreaking. It's yeah. heartbreaking. One of the things we, I've discovered as a coach in talking with women about narcissistically abusive husbands and also just my engagement with different people. And I have, by the way, coached narcissistic people, which is really wild. I've had people diagnosed as narcissists contact me and sometimes they're in a place of, I don't want to be this way. And, and I'm you know, I want to, like, whoa, well, this is, this is wild. Sometimes I even come from the angle of maybe you're not. Maybe you've been hearing this, but the fact that you're digging and researching means perhaps you're not. But what's interesting about these types of personalities when it comes to affection and their wives and their sexuality, to your point, when women will kiss a certain way, want to be affectionate and want to be loving, it comes from a place of them wanting to enjoy it. So women have a, an affection that they want to enjoy and, and it brings them joy. And with these personalities, they're turned off by that. And I know this gets into the number one reason, but they almost prefer to go against what the wife wants. And this is what makes the love bombing portion of the beginning of the relationship so important and so so fast paced, if you will. It's because these aggressive personalities, what really excites them is busting down another person's boundaries. So they're they're more excited about breaking down a person's boundaries, getting to that forbidden fruit, if you will. That's what's exciting. But once it's theirs, the fruit belongs to them, and the fruit's presenting themselves like, "Hey, you know, have me. Let's. I don't. I. I don't. I don't. It's almost too much for them. It makes a narcissistic person, at least to my understanding, it makes them awkward that somebody wants them and wants to have them in that way. So they reject it because they're not having to break anybody's boundaries and they're almost disgusted that somebody wants them. This gets into a little bit some of the deeper things that I've come to understand about narcissistic people. But these types of personalities really do become disgusted with people who like them, love them and want them. And it's a really weird thing. People would think it's the opposite. People all the time want to say, why, why don't. Why won't they let me love them? Why do they get more angry the more I try? Well, it's at some point, because they're constantly running from themselves, because they have so much inner shame, they turn that and look at you and then think you're disgusting. In other words, how disgusting must you be to like somebody like me? That is super gross. You're disgusting. I reject you. Because of their own internal rejection, they reject the person who's trying to love them. and so. Yeah, it's very heartbreaking. And this also plays into why they cheat. Because again, it's about them breaking down the boundaries. It's what's forbidden. And if they can break down the boundaries of a woman who doesn't know doesn't know them, once again, you're getting into that forbidden fruit territory. Well, that excites a narcissistic person. You don't know me very well. I don't know you, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to break down your boundaries so I can feel powerful and good. And then achieve sex or achieve affection in that way. And then they come back to their wives and their wives want it. Why don't you spend time with me? Well, there's no boundaries to break down. And it's kind of gross because a narcissistic person's like, why would, why would you want to touch me? There must be something wrong with you. Don't you know I'm, I'm cheating? It's, it, yeah. you, must be, you must be the dirtiest thing in the world because you want to be with me. So it's a very weird, peculiar and very hurtful and damaging dynamic, which is why you know we do what we do, and you do what you do, I do what I do, so that we can shed light on this, so that women in particularly 
and men, whoever are going through this, they don't take it personally because that's the most important thing. Yeah, and it's really hard. And the other thing is, is that when they're cheating, they're feeding off their slyness. So they get a thrill out of, if I'm getting away with this, you know, she doesn't know. So there's this this control mechanism within them that goes, all right, my slyness is working, I'm above everything because they don't know. And even if you question them, then the thrill is, can I manipulate you to believe what you what you feel or what you think you know is, you know, plaus- I'm going to hit it with plausible denial and I'm going to call you stupid and I'm right. going to, manip- you know, flip it all back on you. How dare you accuse me of that? Right. And then that then feeds it again. So it becomes this competitive cycle that these women are, well, and men, I have met men that have, have fallen in, into it and then they're trying to work out how to fix the relationship if he's not cheating, how, then it comes back to them again going, well, how do I fix this relationship? It's oh, like, boy. That's the it, all-time question. This That gets in some dark territory. But but real quick, before we get into that territory, because that's super important, I just want to touch on the other reasons that I've come across, just in case any of your listeners fall into this category, because all of it can be considered abusive and neglectful in some way, shape, or form. So you have the cheating element uh, or, or an affair, okay? The other one would be... Uh, a medical issue, such as a erectile dysfunction. Now, the reason that I've discovered in, in my coaching sessions one-on-one with people that this is somewhat narcissistic is because there's remedies for that type of stuff. You know, a man in his who's, you know, in his 50s, 60s, you know, th- there's no reason why they cannot go and get treatment if they work it out with their wives. And oftentimes what I hear from women I'm coaching sometimes is, okay, Things don't work the way they did at one time, but that's okay. But they're using it as an excuse, as an accru- as a crutch to do nothing, to do no more affection. And this is where it gets into the territory of, of becoming narcissistic. It's neglectful, where they have ways in which they can treat the issue, first of all. Second of all, they're with a wife who says, hey, we, let's take this at your pace. I'm, I'm willing. But they would rather find comfort in just saying no, and then they put their focus on other things in life, whether it's golf or work or whatever, and then just neglect their spouse. And I hear this a lot. It does an awful lot of damage because it's neglectful. And once again, it leads people into that category of, am I not enough anymore? Am I not desirable? So that was uh, the second to the last reason. One of the the reasons, which was an interesting one for me, was a closet homosexuality. And I was surprised to hear this come up of women who had been married to their husband for 10, 15 years, and then suddenly they're gay. Oftentimes even having children and bringing children into the world. And and this is an interest this is an interesting one like i said and i'm not judgmental and by the way i've coached and i've talked to people who have are homosexual of all different walks of life all different faiths and because when it comes to abuse we all share this in common yeah but this was an interesting one that that they would bring somebody into a marriage into this relationship for so long just string stringing it along like there's nothing wrong and then suddenly, you know, wham, I can't do this anymore. Um, I have a boyfriend or whatever, or I'm hanging out with this guy. And it's it's crushing, but in a strange way to women, as you can imagine. And then obviously the one that you brought up, number one, the number one reason that husbands stop having sex with their wives is the control, which goes back to they're in it to dominate a person's boundaries because they're in control. So love bombing in the beginning of the relationship is super heavy because they get excited by breaking down someone's boundaries. That That's an example of control. It's authority. And then suddenly when they're married, even on the wedding night, I've heard, women have told me, on the wedding night, yes, I've the heard one this. night they're supposed to have mm. a great time and the wife's like, here I am, let's go, and throwing that dress off and get, the guy's like, whoa. No, you're you're a little aggressive about this. And it's like, what? Yeah. Wait, wait, are you the same person? Because you were you you wouldn't you wouldn't stop until <laughs> I did X, Y, and Z when we were dating. 
But yeah. now on our wedding night and I'm ready and I bought this for you and and nothing. Uh, yeah, because and the reason is because they're no longer in control. So with these personalities, being able to break down boundaries is a form of control. And when a wife or, you know, a husband, if it's the opposite for your listeners, when they want it equally, when it's pleasurable, when the wife is like, this is great, I'm so excited, this is what I've wanted, I've been waiting for this night, there's no control in that. A narcissist, you'll know a narcissistically abusive person in that moment because they're no longer in control. Instead, they're sharing a joyful experience, which they can't do. They're either in control or they're afraid and they are angry and they are resentful. And I talk with a lot of people who that happens on their wedding night, yet they stay. And I've had a lot of clients say, I wish looking back, I would I would have gotten an annulment because that was so strange. That wedding night was so strange. But oftentimes they stay because they're hanging on to the person they met. They're hanging on to the love bombing instead of looking at what's right in front of them from there on out. Yeah, and you also get when you when you're someone that's from a well it depends if you if the person the abused is from a toxic chaotic childhood and they've got these beliefs of not being worthy you'll find what they'll do is they'll sacrifice themselves all the way through the relationship so they're trying to work out okay if this is what you need i can accommodate you do you love me now you know, I'll accept you for how you are. Do you love me now? And they don't realise that because their their own lack of self worth has already been manipulated and and smashed before they've. And that's why they're so susceptible to narcissistic people. Because one thing I do know about narcissistic people is that they do read very well, and they can they they're looking and they're prodding all the time, looking for your weak spots. Now, you don't class them as weak spots. You class them as generosity and caring and loving, patience, all those kind of things. But mm -hmm. for a narcissist, they're weapons that they can use against you. And by the time whoever it is that is, is the target or the victim, by the time they realise that this, there's intent behind the nastiness and the slyness and the hurtfulness that they're, that they're now experiencing, they're normally invested and very, very confused, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's interesting because I, I hear um, a lot of people say, well, why didn't they leave? And I was like, don't judge them for not leaving. Don't judge them. Don't hit them with more abuse. Like try and understand where they were and mm -hmm. what their intent was. And you'd find that you'd have a very similar intent if it was you. You might mm -hmm. just not have the length of it. You know, you might not do it for years. You might only do it for a couple of weeks and go, no, bugger this, I'm out of here. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it is a fascina a, fascinating. Yeah, there's a high percentage of, of clients that I deal with that they're, they would say their marriage or their spouse, their husband or their wife is a resemblance of their parents. Yeah. And sure. this is what I find interesting about it. I, and I, I take people kind of on this spiritual trip with it because the way I look at this is that let's say a woman had a neglectful father and or even a mother and I hear this quite a bit I deal with a lot of female clients whose mothers were just horrible mm -hmm. to them uh, and very competitive very demeaning very devaluing made them feel like they couldn't do anything right and so they're always trying to appease the mother always trying to appease the father and as they grow the one thing that they've, what typically happens is they put it on themselves. So a woman yeah. or a man coming out of an abusive childhood will carry the burden. What's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? What, what did, why couldn't I get along with my parents? And so they get into a relationship when they grow up and this relationship or this marriage resembles their parents in a lot of ways, very neglectful, very distant. Mm. and. It's almost like this person in a reverse way, this new spouse who's narcissistic takes the place of the mother and father. And I believe what, based on what I've seen, 
what a wife in the situation is trying to do by staying with them, by appeasing the narcissist, by get, why, why don't you love me on and on and on, is they don't want to face how horrible their parents were yet. They're not at that place yet. They're still in the place of there's something about me. And so they think I'm old enough now. I'm smart enough. I'm educated. I'm in my 20s. I'm in my 30s. I'm in my 40s. I can figure out now how to get my mom and my dad to pay attention to me. I'm, I'm older. I'm smarter. I can talk now. And this is what they're doing in this relationship, trying to get that narcissistic person to change. And they hope it works because if it works and they can get the narcissistic person to change, then they can believe that they were right. It, it was just me. I, I just was too young to know how to understand my mom and dad. They're great people. And I, but that's not what happens. Instead, they're faced with abuse as we all are. And this is where it gets very difficult for us. And this is why we avoid it. Because once that happens and we see it's, it's not us, it's them. Now we have to stand back and say, oh my goodness, there is evil and that's evil. But it's worse than that. We have to look back at our own dads and moms and say that was evil. My dad is evil. My mom is evil in how they and what they did. We have to look at the reality of who they are. And I don't believe any child, even growing up, wants to ever get to that point. We don't want to look back. We don't want to see our parents or people who we love in this way where we have to say, wow, that's... It, I believe that there's certain people, empaths, whatever you want to call them, mm. we would rather carry the burden ourselves. We would rather walk around this life trying to figure out what we can do to understand the world better. But we struggle. And I make this point all the time and I tell people all the time, you've got to snap out of it. We share a world with murderers, thieves, rapists, molesters. And there's also healers. There's also doctors. And this could even be within your own family. This is something in my own spiritual journey. God dealt with me very, very harshly because I struggled with my family of origin as well. And I said, family's supposed to be forever, blah, 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 all this stuff. And that I believed in, in my own spiritual life. God said, Kevin, you need to go back and read the story of Cain and Abel. Everybody's heard of the story of Cain and Abel. What is it? One brother kills the other. And in my own spiritual life, God said, that's the world you live in. That's the truth. I, the truth isn't that's what's possible. And I, and I struggled with that. I said, no, that this is a, that's just an old story. It's not real. And yeah. the reality is, is, no, it is real. In fact, right now, not too long ago, there was a huge court case. Um, the Murdochs or whatever, the, the man who's an attorney got rid of his son, his wife. You know, again, just to put it in perspective, we live in a world where these things happen. And at some point we have to be able to face that and we realize, okay, it's not me anymore. There is, a, there's no pinnacle of kindness or intelligence or anything that I can obtain in this life that's going to get me to a place where my parents who always rejected me will accept me yeah or people who are always abusive will change we get to this place where we understand oh my goodness we are all very different and there are people who are murderous and it's in their nature they're abusive by their nature there's nothing we could ever say no amount of kindness can change it and this is hard once we have to realize this. And, and I tell people in this way, listen, yeah, there's nothing that you could have ever done to have made your father, mother, husband, wife any different. They are who they are. And I, I tell it to them and I, I kind of sign off with putting it in this perspective as well. I want to say to them, listen, we've all come across people who've been very loving. And we oftentimes make the mistake of thinking that those people are loving to us because of us. Right. Like I tell him, I say, think of the most loving person oh, yeah. towards you. You, yeah. you may think it's because of you that they're so loving to you. Right. No, I say, I challenge you. Look at it differently. The people who are loving towards you, it's because that's who they are. That's their nature. When we start looking at the world this way. Prior to dating, 
prior to getting married, it changes the way we form our relationships. When we start to accept, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them. And we accept that people aren't any way because of us. That's the first thing we have to break. That's right? a big one. But I love what you're saying because that that is the tripper for just about every client I've ever had, you know, and, and even for myself is that because you do think if you're enough, then no matter who they are, they will treat Bingo. you with respect. Bingo. They will treat you. Yeah, they will love you. Bingo. And, um, yeah, I've thrown That's myself it. under that many buses. You know, going, oh, it's okay. I'm strong enough. I'll handle this. Yeah. yeah. I'm and Christian you'll lo- enough. <laughs> you yeah. love me for it. No, they don't. <laughs> yes, exactly. You know, that, that was me. The hardest lesson I've ever learned. I'm, I used to have, I call it a, in my own life, I called it a Christian arrogance. Yeah, I did okay. not realize how arrogant I was as a non denominational Christian. I wasn't trying to be. Yeah. I thought I was being loving and, and I was. Yeah. But my attitude was that I'm so loving, I'm so kind. Who could be mean to me? Yeah. <laughs> I can get along with anybody. All I gotta do is carry this this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, right? And and people are gonna respond to it. So you could imagine how crushing it, it was for me and, and for a lot of people. And when you get involved in these relationships and you realize, oh my gosh, this light of mine is no match for that. It doesn't do anything. No. It doesn't do anything. And actually, so I, it's, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry to cut you off, but it's like I, I, I have seen this over and over again. I call it the, the shine of consciousness, and that's where you can feel someone's authenticity. You can feel their joy and their, you know, they just their presence is noticed, and just for, they don't have to do anything. It's just who they are. And when I look at narcissistic people. That is like a neon light to them because if they can dull down that shine, take away that kindness, take away that loving soul, they feel more and more empowered. And it's, and it's fascinating how many people are like, you've got a beautiful shine, you've got a beautiful soul, and you've, through, you know, course of events, that's dulled down on you because of the way someone else has treated you because you thought you could the more you sacrificed yourself, that's the words I sort of use, the more that that person would have to wake up to themselves and realise how good good the person in front of them is. And it never works. I've never heard anyone really make that work with the narcissist. It doesn't. No. Yeah. No. Fascinating. Right. And, you know, on the carrying on, piggybacking off of the topic of how you know we're, we're all very different you cannot change another person i challenge people when somebody hates you or bullies you it's not because of you it's because that's their nature when somebody when somebody loves you it's not because of you it's because that's their nature so where does that leave us where does that leave you and me well the biggest burden that we have in this life is to figure out who we are First of all, in this in this scale, if you will, like I look at it as if we want to know what the scale of life looks like that we live on, you can take stories like Cain and Abel, ancient stories. On one end, you have a murderous person. On the other end, you have somebody who serves. Right. Our our burden in this life is to figure out who are we. Right. I've heard this question before, too. Why does it seem bad people get away with things sometimes? And I heard a, a speaker one time suggest that the reason they do is because they're all in. The most successful people in this world who are narcissistic or in their way, they they own it. They know who they are. And they're like a wrecking ball, a bulldozer. They go for it, right? And, but for some reason, people who are more empathic, maybe more on the light side, on the other end of the scale, instead of being all in with who they are, they're looking at the dang wrecking balls saying, well, that's not fair. And so the biggest burden in this life is to figure out who you are, accept everything about yourself, accept the way you love, accept the way you argue, accept the way you fight, accept your affection, how affectionate of a person you are. 
which means you have to be honest. The yeah. more honest we can become about ourselves, right? Then we can become honest with other people. We can articulate it, right? And we find where we belong. We find the people we belong with. For me personally, the disastrous marriages and all this stuff and all the abuse, it really is a result of, number one, not knowing yourself enough prior to going into a marriage to know who and what you're with. If you don't know and accept yourself, then you have no idea what you're with. We've we've been lied to in a lot of ways saying, well, as long as they're Christian and you're Christian, that's okay. Wrong, right? <laughs> because anything out there can call themselves a Christian. Yeah, true. You know, today we've got churches filled with psychopaths, sociopaths, whatever, right? They're, so that's not it. You have to know your mannerisms, your affection level, the way you talk, the way you want to argue. And then that's burden number one, learning how to be honest with who you are and accept yourself. And then burden number two is somehow learning how to identify these things in other people. And these become your friends and these become your potential partners in life. Mm. The whole the old adage that opposites attract is is a mess. I think that opposites can attract for sure, but opposites can never sustain. I think too is that a lot of the time when something is familiar to you, you can mistake that as attraction. So so if you have if you have been brought up in a toxic family, your boundaries are so far out in front of yourself that they're nearly non existent, right? So when you come towards something that's familiar, you know, you know, okay, that was a hurtful statement they made, but it's all right, I've heard it before, you know, suppress, off you go. Oh, they don't really mean it. I can make excuses. I can get around this beautiful denial. So if it's something is familiar to you, unfortunately we seem to be attracted to that until we really get an understanding of why we're why that is familiar, how that's affected us, and then we start healing, doing the healing journey, which is just being honest with yourself. That's all healing is, is just being honest with yourself of why you feel the way you do about yourself and why that's okay. Because as, as soon as you start learning where your boundaries should be, all of a sudden you're looking at stuff and going, that is not okay. You know, kick that to the curb. That's not okay. That's not okay. That's disrespectful. So you can start identifying what it actually is. But when you're in, still in the spin, I call it, and it's familiar, it's just you're just loading it up onto the belief systems that you've got. So if you've got down in deep and they're normally ingrained, you know, I'm not good enough, I'm unlovable, etc., then it becomes proof. And as humans, what we do is we try to prove our belief systems until we change our belief system. And to do that, you've got to get that real bare bones honesty of going who why do I believe I am unworthy why do I believe it's acceptable for you to be disrespectful to me and then that's when you can really start doing the stepping stones of identifying what kind of relationship you're in how you got there and then you know give yourself some grace too you know sometimes you just I look at some things and I go well it was not going to work any other way because that's what you were attracted to that's what you thought you were comfortable in. You just didn't understand that at the time. So, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. very complex, but it's how it works. It is. And, you know, to your point, falling into a place of comfort, you don't know what you don't know. Exactly. So when you're comfortable with something, whether it's demeaning, devaluing, and in the beginning you're comfortable with it, but as time goes on you realize this isn't who you are, you know. And being comfortable in it doesn't mean that you're enjoying it. Exactly. Yeah. Let's yeah. make that clear. Right. Yeah, very there's, there's clear. A difference between comfort and joy. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's just that you've accepted that it's this is okay. Exactly. And, and you can be a really strong person and go, okay, I can ride over this. I can ride over this. Or you can be pulling it back into your own victim mentality and going, oh, everybody treats me like this. And, you know, sink into that real victim y sort of thing, sort of place. Or, or you can actually go into a type of shock where you go, I can't believe this is happening again. So then you start to believe that everybody's going to treat you like that because there's something wrong with you and that's where the shame comes in. As soon as you start believing there's something wrong with you, you're, you're dealing with shame. 
I come across I come across this a lot too. What's yeah. wrong with me? How come I keep coming across this, right? And and the only conclusion I can have goes back to what we talked about you know, a moment ago, the failure to understand that we are all very different. So when I listen to oftentimes people say there's something wrong with me, how did I end up in this marriage again or this relationship again, on and on and on, it's what I still hear in this is that everybody's the same. Why am I not fitting in? You know, what to that extent, yeah. because they have not yet externalized it, saying, whoa, we're all different. I'm me and they're them. And that's and we're not alike at all. Uh, which, you know, is, is typically where a person needs to start to, to get. And, but this, and oftentimes people are stuck in these toxic relationships, especially marriage, not even because of the person anymore. It's not because they don't love the person. Because when I deal with people and I'm honest with them and they're honest with me, they don't love them. They hate them. Mm. They hate their neglectful spouse. They, they hate the person. But the thing that they're attached to is is the thing, the concept, the idea, love, which is a thing. What is it exactly? Well, I don't know. It's just it's it's love. I've it's supposed to be the most important thing, and so I'm bonded. So most people aren't even trauma bonded to a person. They're trauma bonded to these things like love or trust is another one. They're bonded to these things, and and. Because they have to start to understand that this word love doesn't quite exist the way they thought it always did. It doesn't, what it, it's, it's meaningless. Well, we're taught love conquers all. Bingo. <laughs> yes. Right. I know. And, and this gets into some wild territory. Then we got to go down the route of, you know, was the word love, the word love that you and I use, is it even a word that was used in the Bible? And, and frankly, it wasn't. We hear it because of our English loose translations. However, if you go back into the ancient days, they didn't have the word love. It didn't exist. They they mm -hmm. used different words for different types of connections that people had. Yeah. We use this one word called love and boom, we're bonded to it. We're married because of love. I'm in this abusive relationship because of love. Yeah. It's it's you can hate the person, but love. Yeah. It's and it stops making sense. And right. And you can only do that for so long and then you start to work your well, way out of it. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and by I, the way, this is this is what parents and this is my understanding. It was our parents' responsibility to really help us and guide us in a way of having a healthy understanding what to watch out for, how to identify who we are, become ourselves, on and on and on. Whatever happened in our parents' generation and their parents' generation, the trickle-down effect of all the failures of parenting <laughs> really <laughs> left us lost. And yes. we've all been learning this as we're going. So for most people in a toxic marriage, listen, give yourself patience. Again, you don't know what you don't know. So a yeah. lot of what you're experiencing you know, and you're waking up right now looking at your husband or your wife saying, I have no idea what I'm doing in this marriage, what I'm doing with this person, how I even got here, what I believed in that got me here because I'm miserable. Yeah. You have to have a, a sense of, of patience with yourself and, and being able to say, nobody told me. Nobody, nobody told me that love is not enough. Yeah. Which it's not. Love is not a partnership. Love is just love, yeah. right? And it's it's sad because I, I deal with a lot of people who are in something for love, but there's no partnership. There's no even friendship in the marriage. There's no, it's not even equally yoked. Yeah. You yeah. know, and so there was a, there was a miscommunication somewhere between parents, even church. I, I think church dropped the ball big time. Again, church was out there saying, hey, just, as long as you both believe in Christ and as long as you have love in your heart, that says nothing about being a partnership. It, it doesn't teach anybody about being equally yoked. You yeah. know, and oftentimes I tell people, look, God forbid I ever become a, a premarital counselor because <laughs> I would I would shake those people up. I would be like, 
let's i want to hear what you do when you argue i want to hear this you know each one of them individually how much sex do you like to have how much sex do you like to individually right and pick it apart and say you all you're gonna have problems because i see where this is is not in alignment and i'm not in agreement with post-marital counseling and i'll tell you why a lot of people will do that they'll stay in an abusive marriage and go to counselors Mm. marital counselors for help all a counselor can do at the point where people realize oh my gosh we are nothing alike we're so different all a counselor can do is help them learn how to compromise with each other that's it well can you compromise here can you compromise there compromising doesn't change the person and so then what you have is you're living the rest of your life in a marriage being fake compromising for each other and this is a dicey territory but My suggestion is, what do you want to do? Do you want to spend the rest of your life compromising when you can find a partnership to where you don't have to compromise? Perhaps I'm I'm being too idealistic, but I would prefer to have somebody in my life who's a partner who I don't have to compromise and neither do they. We're just together. We understand each other and we we celebrate our similarities. Yes. I don't want to compromise and I don't want someone to compromise with that's ridiculous. I mean, if you think about it, it's like, let's say the problem in a marriage is no sex, no affection. Compromising would look like somebody pretending to want to have sex. Well, how exciting is that going to be for the rest of your life? Well, I'm here with my partner and they're, I know they don't want to have sex with me, but they're doing a good job pretending to. Pretending, yeah. That's horrible. And, and you're going to live the rest of your life that way. Or maybe you want to travel and they don't. Yeah. Compromise would look like, okay, I'll go on a trip with you. Oh boy, my partner's going on a trip with me, even though they don't want to. Want to. <laughs> and it's miserable. Yeah. So you really have to sort out is this, is, am I bound to live this way in life? Is this really what the Bible says? Is this what God says that I have to have no life? I have to subject myself to nothingness when. I could be living a life where, and I and I say this too, that it's not about what you're not getting. Oftentimes people in marriage in, who are married to narcissists, they really think, I'm not getting this. I'm not getting affection. I'm not getting love. It's worse than that. You're not able to give. Yeah. You're not able to give who you are. You're not able to love the way you've been designed to love. You're not able to communicate and have empathy the way you've been designed to have empathy. And that's the worst part because you're going to live your life now and then you're going to face your creator and your creator is going to say, I gave you this in life. I gave you this type of love. I gave you this type of affection. What'd you do with it? And you're going to be like, why? I I, don't blame me. Uh, You brought a man into my life and I was married to him and he didn't want my love. So I did nothing. I clammed up and did nothing with it. And I think deep down each and every one of us know that that's a horrible thought. It's not about what we're not getting. It's about how we're being stopped in our in our living. Yeah, and and I don't think um, people are talking about that enough because in these kind of neglectful relationships, to survive in them, the 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 victim actually has to shut down part of themselves. All of so, them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then and then what happens is when when it, you know, if somewhere along the line this is hitting the brick wall where there's nowhere, you know, you can't keep doing what you're doing. And when you hit that point, all those things that you suppressed within yourself, you're going to realize what price that cost you. So That's that right. that that level of regret that that hits you very hard. I understand this personally. Is huge because all the reasons why you can have good intentions, but they may not be smart ones. You know, they they may they may be at the cost of yourself. So when you hit that point, all those regrets and all those things that you swallowed and all those things that you pushed away, all of a sudden you realize they cost you a part of yourself. Yeah. And then you've got to work real hard to get all that back, and you've got to do it through that toxic confusion of trying to work out, which can be a brilliant way of really spiritually evolving and understanding yourself because you've got nowhere else to go bar honesty otherwise you're going to stay in the resentment you're going to stay in the bitterness 
you're going to get right. spiteful. You, you're going to turn into what you despised about the person that put you, took you there. Yes, yes. And, and, and that's when I talk about narcissism, the main thing I try to do with my clients is get them to understand indifference because narcissistic people, they're on a spectrum, they're not all the same. You know, they can, so the level of willingness of them to be indifferent to you is, is what does the damage. We all respond to, you know, people that are indifferent to us. Do not care how their actions are going to affect us. But then where you really have to go into that healing journey is what about your own indifference to the truth of who you are? And that's, that, that's it. Yeah, that's, that's the it. one. Yeah. If, if the goal is to get in this life to a place where you can live out of who you are, identify your purpose, all of this comes from your daily interactions. And if you don't have a primary person in your life that you can go to and explore who you are, love them the way you're meant to love talk and communicate the way you're meant to communicate well you're just going to shut down yeah and you're and you, you might as well be dead and this is why a lot of people feel dead so it's not in an abusive marriage it's not always about what you're not getting it's what you are robbing yourself of it's what's being robbed of you it's 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 your life yeah. and 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 you're just you clam up and so it's very difficult one of the things that i wanted to throw your way to and this this is something that i have discovered helps people i want to put the narcissistic term aside mm -hmm. because i'm gonna i'm gonna blow your mind here for a moment can i i'm ready and, and, kevin all right so <laughs> here, here we go here we go i'm not really gonna blow your mind i, I really think that deep down you're gonna say yeah I, I i get this but well explorers we're gonna split this episode into two because as you can tell kevin and i have a lot to say but i'm going to leave you with a story and it's called the soul who endured a thousand cuts, the wounds from narcissistic abuse cut deep. The soul who endured a thousand cuts, written by Lorraine Nylon. I wanted to share a life and be loved and held in the arms of the one I could call my rock. Instead, I felt the blade of your tongue and the shards of your indifference towards my feelings and soul. I endured the deliberate leeching of my self-esteem and attempted to appease your toxicity with my unconditional love, to which you took as being entitled to take me to your lair. This became the graveyard of my happiness and the cuts came at every turn. Highlights of my life became smeared with your lack of empathy and demeaning remarks. Your selfishness knew no bound, and then you denied the truth at what you'd done. I begged many times for a chance of renewal, believing if I was strong enough, we'd turn adversary into a love song. This was matched with empty words that reinstated my hope but it was all false promises that manipulated me to this fate. I yearned for what would never come. As I felt the aspirations and began to believe your forked tongue, I doubted my worth and felt unlovable. I became the doormat to your narcissism and for this I will take responsibility. I believed if I loved you enough the best was yet to come, but nothing arrived, and I surrendered to the doormat I'd become. They're never expected to move. They get a little dirty, shake it off, and start doing it all again. The pattern was set until I felt my own swan song. I felt my spirit seep from my unattended wounds, and I recognised that only more neglect was the foresight for this impending doom. As you unabashedly devalued me, I lost my dignity, but withheld my integrity. I chose not to be what you offered me and remained supportive and loving, unaware that I was enabling my own despair. 
I looked for what had snippets of respect, and I clung to the breadcrumbs offered that were perceived as a feast, which revealed how little I'd come to expect. You didn't care about the pain you caused, and I became the arena for your tantrums and condemnation. Some were scratches, others slashes, but all were collected and they became the shadow on my heart. You delighted in testing my boundaries and I kept moving them to accommodate my compassion for the insecurity on display. Your denial slashed my hope and an emotional numbness befell me as I suppressed what I felt and knew to be true. I hid my awareness that you were not a love story and shielded myself from the true extent of your moroseness. Trials and tribulation came and went and I attempted to immune myself to the discord within my soul. I dulled my love and ignored my wounds and a complacency shadow descended upon me. As the cuts grew deep and joined, I couldn't remember what I was waiting for. And then the blade struck low and brought me to my knees. I looked behind and could only see misery. The accumulation of hurt and pain could no longer be suppressed within me and I kneeled before a history of unrest. I remembered there was a line I was looking for where I could no longer endure another cut. I had waited for it to come and our history shall not be a debate. The spark of my soul burnt bright which was difficult to recognise from within the regret I felt but I knew it was time to disband what was only ornate. The intensity of the details was hidden to most, but the cuts upon my soul begged to differ. The curse was over, and I shall not gaslight myself into submission to false hope. Freedom beckoned, and I heeded the call, because now I feel the love for my soul. My resilience has already been tested, for I can endure, but I know the price I paid for holding open the door. The silence is replaced with honesty, and it is time to shut the door. I want to protect the inner sanctum of my soul, but I have been groomed to override the unrest within my soul. I now listen and hear myself roar as I call for freedom from this traumatic stress. It's time to refocus and value my relationship with myself and a life of possibilities that I'll navigate. Discernment is my ally and I no longer entertain the belief that I must sacrifice myself to give grace. Grace can be given as I walk away, relinquishing the toxicity that has always been at my gate. Truth acknowledged will set me free. Fear cannot withstand my recovery.